Uh, the first speaker will be Lada Nuzna, who is currently the director the project director at the Impetus Foundation. And uh, she will talk about changing the timelines for life extension research. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Ilya already mentioned, I run Impetus Grants. I also do research in aging biology and molecular tool development. Um, in Impetus, we fund non-conventional aging research, which you might or might not know about, but I want to start this presentation with a question. Um, how many successful aging clinical trials do you expect to happen by the time you are 80 or 90? If you see, do a simple back of the envelope calculation, and I estimate very simplistically here, we get a few big health span trials per year. If you measure your Romanian life in the number of trials we can run during those years, we get a few hundred trials or way less total until aging becomes a big concern on a personal level. Now, how many of those clinical trials are actually going to be successful? Given the success rate of clinical studies, the number of hits in those trials will be low or close to zero. I admit that the question on the slide might be somewhat radically phrased and doesn't take into account the fact that sometimes good things happen by chance. I mean, no one could have predicted CRISPR and it completely changed the research landscape as it looks right now and the types of things we can do. But I would argue that we do not want to rely on luck too much. It might or might not come. This brings me to the question of the rate at which great aging research comes into life. If you think about it, there are two variables we can tweak here for improving the outcomes. One of them is hit rate, so the quality of research. And the second one is the rate at which we get research done and published, the rate at which we start new clinical trials. So this is the old good uh, quality quantity dichotomy. Now, quality of research is not entirely a black box, but serendipity plays a huge role in it. As such, quality of research is much harder to control systematically. The rate at which research occurs is an entirely observable variable though. And while the research process or clinical trials cannot simply be accelerated because they take time to output a result, we can still often accelerate the boring parts, the bureaucracy, the grant writing, the year long back and forth to publish papers and other things. Um, that's exactly what we did at Impetus. It sort of started with uh, as a reaction to two things. Uh, one of them is that traditional funding is under exploring directions of aging biology and became too conservative too early on, which is always risky with new fields. In a way, it's almost paradoxical. The biggest risk in this case is not to take enough risks with types of things you fund. Um, the second observation is that um, was how slow funding is. Traditional funding cycle is about a year, which holds back many researchers from starting their work. We started a year ago, so you'd expect there isn't much to share of our results for now, but one can get a lot done when there is a radical simplification of the process. So all in all, in one year, we funded 114 projects with breakdown of some directions on this slide. I have seen around seven papers published in this year with three being an outlier good science in my humble opinion. Um, I think a year ago, I wouldn't be ready to say that impetus is 100% a good idea. I mentioned it several times in other presentations too. At the start, we don't really know whether impetus did since right or not. We were cutting 50 page proposals down to two pages, making decisions after only like 15, 20 minutes of total review time per application, removing all the preliminary data and making a lot of risky bets in agent science. And there is no track record that this can be a good idea. And yet now seeing the first work come out, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it was indeed a much needed program. As such, throughout my work, I think a lot about how we can change timelines of current agent research, not as I already mentioned, not all parts of research can be accelerated. Um, you cannot accelerate the normal cycle of trial and error or clinical studies, but bureaucracy is not a clinical trial. We can and should minimize it or ideally remove it from funding process completely. Um, Impetus tried to be an agent of change here, but after a year of running a program, um, I started coming to the conclusion that the change in timelines and efficiency cannot just come from a few private donors who decided to do things more efficiently. I mean, $25 million budget is a lot, but that's absolutely nothing compared to billions of dollars at which 
governmental organizations operate. So these quick fixes would just be patches on a system that doesn't globally work well. Uh, which leads me to present the work I've been doing more recently, um, a policy change within National Institute of Health and National Institute of Aging to enable its institutes to fund things faster. I really hope we can help figure out how not to hold scientists back by making them wait for funding for longer than a year, which is the current timeline. It's also somewhat amusing to me that the size of the grant has little to no correlation with uh, funding timelines. In other words, even proof of concept just take a year to fund. So many transformative ideas that exist in this area are historically underfunded with one famous example of Kathleen Carrico famously struggling to get her funding from NH for her breakthrough mRNA vaccine work. Intuitively, it seems that having longer grant applications and longer review process ensures that both researchers and reviewers alike commit lots of effort in addressing all the pitfalls and failure modes uh, before research starts. While technically true, the dissertation doesn't consider the unpredictable nature of research. And additionally, history proves again and again that the quality of endeavor is largely uncorrelated from longer planning timelines. I mean, of the recent examples, it took Moderna 45 days to develop scenes from the moment COVID genome was published. That's an absolutely like crazy timeline for anything. And uh, during World War II, National Defense Research Committee was funding since uh, within one week of grant application, and it led to things like proximity fuse, the radar, like Manhattan project. Maybe we need more Manhattan projects of aging. Um, so it started this work I'm presenting here. It started as a policy memo draft, and later found its own support with an advocacy group in DC that is now gathering for this, uh, gathering support for this at Congress. Um, officially, this memo will be published within the next two weeks, but I wanted to present its key suggestions today. Uh, one of them is development of an age directive to all of its 36 institutes, including National Institute of Aging, and more importantly for me, National Institute of Aging, to deploy programs with faster funding timelines. Um, the second one is creation of working group that can like make this authorization happen. And the last one is, um, investigation into how government reacted to COVID pandemic because government actually did have to record, record of funding this fast, but no one knows about it. Most scientists I talked to in the United States have no idea that there are any fast grants happening within the government, which is a mystery how they happened without anyone knowing. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll publish them soon so you can read more about that there. So why am I presenting this here? First, of course, I really believe that the more people a certain information will reach, the more likely it is that things will happen and serendipity, serendipity will be on our side. If you have ideas about how to get this more to more people within government, please, please do reach out. Um, I left my email on this last slide. Right now, I'm in touch with directors of different programs within National Institute of Aging, but ideally, we can get more representatives from NIH to support this policy. Second, this policy memo concerns NIH. I decided to focus on NIH and not on global policymaking because if it's specific um, to everyone, it's really specific to no one. Um, that being said, if you want to make it work in Europe or you know people who might be interested in doing it, please also contact me and I would love to brainstorm about this with you. As a final note, I wanted to mention that our progress happens not only in the labs and benches, but also on a more systematic level. In a way, I hope that more people will be involved in this type of advocacy in aging, because right now neither Europe nor, nor the United States are ready for their first real longevity trial, let alone first real longevity drug. Now, it's my first time presenting this work anywhere at all. So far, I have been gathering opinions from policymakers, government, but ultimately the people uh, that will benefit the most from this work are real scientists. I think it would be fair if we used Q&A session for feedback, criticism, suggestions related to this idea. So please do let me know if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lada. Uh, guys, uh, leave your questions in the chat uh, so um, uh, we can ask them now or during the uh, questions and answer sessions. Uh, so please, uh, for now, uh, do you have any questions? 
not yet. If not yet, then you know, um, save your answers um, for for later. So questions for later. Oh, here's one. Is it sensible to assume that NH objectively wants to extend lifespan? Elders are expensive to the government, um, and our best angle is to defeat the tendency in healthy aging is cheaper than chronic disease. Uh, what is your take on that? Um, well, I don't know if institutions themselves hold an opinion. It's usually the leaders of institutions that can have strong opinion. Um, this policy memo itself doesn't um, assume any opinion, like any of those opinions um, and it's like targeted. That's why it's like targeted towards NIH in general and doesn't use like controversial language because that's an easier way to make sure it will happen. Um, I also see that Aubrey asked uh, to what extent will this program need legislation. I think this program is legislation. This, would, this won't work unless um, we'll find support in Congress. So um, it is policy work. Yeah, so Lara, um, just to amplify the question, um, uh, because yeah, I mean, in principle, of course, uh, money could be taken from one place into another within the NIH without any new money. But uh, clearly, if there is new money, that would require legislation and that would be much better, uh, though there are possi the possibilities of executive orders. Um, uh, I was just thinking um, it would be very valuable if you were to work with the various people who are currently lobbying Congress in this area. I'm sure you know of A4LI, which we're funding, and um, also um, Schmidt Futures are doing some work in that area. So maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, uh, we actually, so I started this from like an inspiration from Schmidt, Schmidt Futures, so that's a reasonable assumption. Um, I, I don't know if it's a, like, I'm trying to, like, when I was writing this policy memo, I was trying to, like, make it as easy for government as possible to make it happen. So I don't assume any new money come into space. I just assume that, um, like, what we want to get is from NIH to enable its own institutes to, like, launch alternative programs. So not only the normal funding yearly cycle, but, like, okay, we want urgent grants now. Can we make them happen next month? Great, great. Uh, and by the way, thank you. Um, uh, if you don't want to write uh, your questions in the chat, you can actually raise uh, your hand as Aubrey did and uh, we'll address you. So any other questions? We still have time. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Daria asks if you can uh, send the presentation. Actually, we already have it recorded, but if you can. Yeah, I can send the presentation. Um, I don't know if this question is addressed to me, but someone asked if I know oh. about. Uh, yes, all the questions are for you for, for now. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you know something about AI simulations of clinical trials? And what do you think about simulating trials to speed up the research? I mean, <laughs> it's like all models are on. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I spent um, a while doing deep learning research. I kind of transitioned out of it because statistics is like one of those tools that can really easily full one like genome-wide association studies like sometimes you can just like flip it in any way you want and like you want you can create a simulation such that it tells you the things you want to see um so it's very tricky maybe yeah in the future right now it all relies on data and i don't think we have the right type of data to do those things okay great other questions All right. If there are no other questions, then uh, we move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Lada, again. Thank and, you. Uh,